welcome back to a positively brontosaurian special edition of Movie Watch. Still to come, more from our reviewers. The film's got a thumbs up so far, but what will those final scores be? And a modern Stone Age family-sized visit to the set of the Flintstones. But first... They say as we grow up, our imagination gets smaller. But one man has kept the corridors of his mind unaffected by the aging process. Try to imagine 45 years ago, an average street in an average town. Not dissimilar to this one. Except this was in Cincinnati, America, and a none too average baby was born. A baby that was to change the way we see our universe. He may not have known it then, but within 12 years he'd have directed his first film, and at the age of 26 he'd have turned Jaws into the biggest film of all time. Only to top it seven years later with the $720 million grossing E.T. So join me on a trip into the wonderful world of Steven Spielberg and find out how to turn your childhood anxieties into big screen, big money blockbusters for just 85 pounds. First, you need a happy family home, something Stephen never had as a child, but he's been trying to recreate ever since in his films. The Spielberg movie family consists of cute kids and cuddly bearded Richard Dreyfus as Stephen's alter ego. For your economy epic, grow a beard yourself, get two cute blonde kids and a mute blonde wife, and you're all set to climb mashed potato mountain. Next, you need a bedroom scene. For most directors, this is a time for hot erotic love action. But Spielberg draws on his own personal experience. As a boy, he would escape the sound of his parents rowing and vigorously exercise his imagination, creating a fictional friend who would later make him an extraterrestrial amount of cash. We, on the other hand, will gain exactly the same effect using four simple household ingredients. Some bubble wrap, some sausages, a stocking, and a small child. Wave. Incidentally, Stephen's mum runs a kosher deli, which might be where he got the inspiration for E.T.'s fingers. At the age of 12, Spielberg started making his own movies casting the kids who bullied him at school to stop them duffing him up and fell into a fantasy world of his own making. In 1977, he reworked Firelight, a $500 sci-fi epic he made when he was 16, into the $20 million Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And our no-budget spaceship, a lampshade. <laughs> Stephen's been known to cut corners himself. He shot extra scenes for Jaws in his editor's swimming pool. At Movie Watch, we thought, wait a second. Why don't we make the whole film in a bath? It is as if God created the devil and gave him Jaws. Stephen knows the meaning of splashing out only too well. The kidmeister of cinematic childhood innocence was the subject in real-life middle age of Hollywood's most expensive divorce, paying out £59 million to ex-wife Amy Irving. So, don't get married. Be a workaholic instead. This year alone saw Spielberg finishing Jurassic Park, shooting his new grown-up movie Schindler's List, and executive producing The Flintstones. So, ignore the usual advice and try and do as many projects as you can at any one time. Stephen, you may never have grown up or won an Oscar, but we humbly offer you this every expense spared movie watch tribute. Enjoy. Let's talk about awe, shall we? That's not awe as in either awe, and it's not awe as in... It's awe as in the big, awestruck scene that happens in every Steven Spielberg film. In Close Encounters, it's when the spaceship first comes down to Earth. In E.T., it's when we first see the little guy. And in Jurassic Park, it's... Cretaceous period. I mean, this thing is about this thing. Why? What's it? How fast are they? No 
we clocked the T-Rex at 32 miles an hour. T-Rex? Mm-hmm. You said you've got a T-Rex? Uh-huh. Say again. <laughs> we have a T-Rex. There was a very funny bit where the lawyer was eaten in one mouthful by Tyrannosaurus Rex. I like that. And that's where I first started getting really gripped. I couldn't believe it. It was just... The dinosaurs were actually quite realistic, almost absolutely perfect. Herds of gallimimuses and running velociraptors, and they're not just running. They're falling over, walking into things, eating things, and they're quite realistic. Go away! One minute it was really, really scary, and like you were like holding on to the edge of your seat sort of thing, and then the next minute you'd be laughing. It's a vegisaurus, Lex! Vegisaurus! <laughs> they were frightening in that they're large, they can eat you, they can tread on your car and smash it. And at the beginning, you were given this pretty gory and terrifying description of how dinosaurs hunted and ripped you open and ate you when you're alive. There's one part where a T-Rex is attacking kids in the car, and you're almost wanting the dinosaur to eat the kids. You're screaming, eat them, eat them. Because you want Spielberg to break free if there's a like family, sort of like family-making mold tradition of American films. Spielberg kind of likes his kids, doesn't he? Of course, you know as soon as you see them that they're not going to get gobbled up by anything. But they came quite close, which was quite fun. <laughs> I didn't think anyone would get killed in it or anyone would be eaten alive, but you like thought, oh my God, maybe they will get eaten. To make a film like that is very, very difficult. And yet here comes some funny little beardy weirdy and turns them out in the sleep. Very annoying, but um, good, very entertaining. I'll give Jurassic Park eight. It's a stunning eight. It's well worth going to see. I'll give it a nine. Me too, I'll give it a big monster stomping nine out of 10 which gives Jurassic Park a super tyrannosaur away 34 points. What do you think of that, Jeff? That's great, Charlie. That's very flattering. Jurassic Park is already the blockbuster hit of the summer in the States. In its first month, it grossed $150 million of dino dosh. But forward thinker Spielberg is already working on his next film. Here's Laurie in a quarry. To make a film set in 10,000 BC, where do you find a prehistoric Shangri-La untouched by human hands? Well, would you believe they found an old rock quarry just like the one Fred Flintstone used to work in, just 15 minutes from Hollywood. Wonder Boy executive producer Steven Spielberg is mining yet another aspect of his childhood. No, I'm not talking about Jurassic Park, although I am talking about dinosaurs. This time it's the Flintstones he's bringing to the big screen, and it's taken four years to do it. Never, never do. A major part of the film is trying to bring bedrock to life. Our architecture, our furniture, our clothing, our hairstyles all emanate from that style of, of late 50s, early 60s kind of, what do you call that, googie <laughs> architecture. This is the Wilma dress, and I wear this throughout the movie, and it's the exact replica of the cartoon dress right down to the off the shoulder and the jagged cut. <laughs> Of course, the famous Wilma Beads. But it goes up from there. You'd think it wouldn't be too hard to remake a 30-year-old cartoon series, but no, the movie went through six script rewrites before everyone was happy. Making the Flintstones real is clearly tougher than it looks. Well, uh, I watched a couple Flintstones episodes, and I got down the Betty Rubble laugh, and uh, I feel, figured at least I had the laugh, that was enough. And here it is for you. <laughs> I'm allowed to take a little bit more creative license than, say, the cartoon in terms of I can move more three-dimensionally than she could. Hi, Wilma. Did you have to bond with Elizabeth to play her best friend? I did. Uh, we went camping for three weeks alone with just some rocks, some bones, just to get in the feel of the whole thing. We're both method actresses, and... Uh, I really feel like I am Betty right now. <laughs> I'll try anything. I'll That's the wives. As for the husbands, compact comedian Rick Moranis was the obvious choice to play Barney Shut Rubble. And who else but the well-nourished John Goodman could wear Fred Flintstone's ample leopard skin. Mind. Stephen saw John Goodman on the set of Always as he related this to me. And he said, you know, you look just like Fred Flintstone. Well, John is Fred. I mean, it's very difficult for me to think of anybody else playing Fred Flintstone. People so often come over to me and go, you are so funny, and I love that guy who plays your husband, John Goodman. So now that I got to meet him, I said, a lot of people like you because they think I'm Roseanne Barr. And they asked me, well, who do you see is, uh, is Wilma's mother? And I said, Elizabeth Taylor. And sure enough, we asked her, and she's a Flintstones fan. 
and agreed to be in the film. What's he talking about? There must be some mistake. Well, she kind of looked at me like a, like one of her kid's friends. 30 days into filming and in temperatures of 100 degrees, the citizens of Bedrock are wilting. Even the kids are feeling the heat, but then some of them are from Reykjavik. Well, the two Bam Bam, who are adorable, if I could find one of them, I'd pick them up to show you. But um, they're from Iceland, and English is not their primary language, and they're four, and they've never done a film. So you have to do things like walk. It's hard for them. You're like, come over to me, buddy. Come on, come over to me. OK, ready? Rolling. Come over to me, buddy. Come on. And they'll go in the middle of the tag. Rosie, I want to go play with you on your trailer. I don't want to make a movie. I want to see the movie and have popcorn. OK, cut. Take 97. What the heck? The pay is good. <laughs> Well, we've given the past a pretty good seeing to, but what of the future? I don't know, but I can tell you this. The next movie watch will be completely dinosaurless. That is, of course, unless Steven Spielberg decides to make a Jurassic Park 2. See you soon. Have a good summer. The Science of Dinosaurs is explained in a Channel 4 booklet and comes complete with Origami Kit. It can be yours for £4.95. Just send a cheque or post order made payable to Channel 4 to Dynamania, PO Box 4000, London, W3 6XJ.